rebuilding the whole software and essentially in this iteration we're going to have USA, Canada, Euro codes with national annexes, uh, the Australian code and New Zealand code all in all member design calculators. So. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to Mass Timber experts. Today, we caught up with Adam Jones and Ringo Thomas, the co-founders of CLT Toolbox, a structural design software making Mass Timber simple and accessible. CLT Toolbox is solving a major bottleneck to the adoption of Mass Timber by building tools to enable traditional engineers to become timber specialists. But before we jump in, if you want the tools, resources, and connections to get Mass Timber into more projects, we're hosting the second annual Mass Timber Group Summit this August in Denver to help you do just that. We've got 30 plus sessions, three amazing networking parties, eight masterminds, and building tours of the coolest projects in Denver, all to give you the tools needed to use Mass Timber with confidence, have client conversations, and make more projects happen. Check out the link in the show notes below for more info. And if you like these podcasts, subscribing to the channel is the biggest compliment you can give us. So with that, let's get into it. CLT Toolbox, what do you guys do and who are you helping? Well, thanks so much for having us on the podcast, Brady and Nick. So CLT Toolbox, we provide design infrastructure for the design of mass timber buildings to make it as easy as possible, basically, for everyone out there. So right now, our product is for structural engineers uh, with structural engineering software to automate their design processes. So we sell license sales to the engineers to automate the design, but also to the supply chain as well, who are looking to get in front of those structural engineers and also make it as easy for them to actually, and frictionless as possible for them to sell their products. So at the very high level, that's what we've got right now. And um, we've built the product ready for the ANZ market, Australia, New Zealand. At the moment, we're in the process right now of uh, about to launch in Europe, actually. So there's a funny thing called national annexes and all these nuances we actually (laughs) need to build for for the European context. So um, we're about to launch that. And in parallel, we've got exciting uh, launches coming on connections because pretty much after launching our first version, which was member design, everyone's like, yeah, cool member design. It's fantastic. You got the best software out there for that. But my problem for sure is around connection design. That's the hardest thing when it comes to mass timber design. So we've essentially had a lot of the team dedicated there. So about to launch connections um, and later we can talk a bit about what we're doing with the USA and Canadian market. Got it. Got it. And you guys uh, came out of the gate about six months ago, if I'm, if I remember that right. And then you guys have got a pretty good team, pretty guy, pretty good size team as well as a very talented team. But like, how did you guys meet? I heard there's a story behind that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good origin story. So yeah, we go here obviously. And thanks again for having us guys. So um, uh, I'm, I'm a New Zealander originally. I, I grew up in New Zealand. I moved to Australia um, or moved to Melbourne specifically in my early 20s, maybe when I was 20. And a few years into that, I found myself somehow giving a talk. At, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm a salesperson, entrepreneur. Like I bring the software side into the business. But I was at a Engineers Australia event and I'd somehow found myself giving a talk to a room full of engineers with this other guy. And the talk was on... Um, uh, tech and the future of the workforce. So the way that tech is infu- improving over time. And so, you know, I, d- I prepped, I got up there, I gave this, some, you know, what I thought was a great talk. I was really happy with myself and I came out the back of it and I had this interview, I had a message on LinkedIn from this guy called Adam Jones. He goes, Hey man, like, you know, loved what you were talking about. I'm, I'm about to start a podcast. Do you want to be on the podcast? I'm like, yeah, man, <laughs> I got asked to be on a podcast off a talk. That's awesome. So I organized a time with Adam. I'm like, this sounds great. I think we're meeting on a Saturday or a Sunday during the day, Adam. And, mm. you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe like three hours before we're due to meet, I get a call from Adam. He's just like, hey, so um, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on my way up now to meet you. I'm calling the library to see if they have a room we can record in, but I can't really find one. So maybe we'll just meet at the park. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all right, man. Like, so, sounds good. And I never, um, I, turns out Adam didn't actually have a podcast yet. And I was his first ever podcast guest. And so we went and sat down in the park. We had a mic next to us in the computer and recorded what undoubtedly is the worst podcast of all time. I'm like, 
like 23 talking about urbanization trends that, that I'd Googled like three hours before that <laughs> podcast meeting. And so funnily enough, Adam ended up deleting that, but we just ended up staying friends. So, you know, those sort of friends are like got on pretty well. So, you know, you give a call every now and then, you catch up every month or so. And then as the years evolved, you know, particularly during COVID, we'd go on walks around the lake in our local area, just sort of catch up and just just, just shoot the shit really as two, two guys are trying to build their career in a certain direction. And, and then when Adam, you know, s- sort of started building CLT Toolbox, he founded it and he started bringing it to life. I was, I was sort of helping, you know, I was just, I was just coming to some meetings, helping with some sales and thinking, yeah, may- maybe, maybe raising some money could be an, a good idea from investors. And I go, oh, I'll help you do that, man. I've never done that before. Like, I'm sure we can figure that out. And um, we went out and started talking to some early investors and, and really early on realized that, um, A, for me, I went to interviews with Adam with some engineers where he's showing the software and I was just astounded by how positive their response was, to be honest, for engineers. You know, normally I'm seeing them kind of look at, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. But they looked at Adam's thing went, it's amazing. And then, uh, um, so it was that combined with, as we spoke to some of our early investors, they, they felt that the combination of the two of us was kind of important for, you know, the growth of a venture-backed business. And so the, um, Adam, you call it the daemon, right? Like the, the sort of spirit of the business got a hold of me. And uh, I, you know, so I gave long sort of four months notice to where I was previously working and spent that time transitioning to June last year to come in full time. Yeah, I got. I, I love the the scrappy beginnings uh, origin stories that we're hearing around. Like it's like, it, you know, guys have great ideas. They make they meet great partners, and then they do great things together, right? And that's it's very similar to how Nick and I met. So like we met on the board of a local nonprofit, you know, a million miles from the mass timber market, and then fast forward seven what seven years or something like that in our friendship, Nick. Yeah, something like that. And then Nick calls me. He's like, Hey, man. Let's go build a let's go build a project. And I was like, that's cool, but I'm only building new stuff. And he's like, Have you heard about this stuff called mass timber? And I was like, hey. yeah. And he's like, Well, we're going to Portland, man. We're gonna go to the IMTC and you're gonna learn all about it. And we did. So wow. yeah, it was a it was a great yeah. uh kind of like partner thing, just kind of like you guys had talked about. But te- teams make the make everything better, right? And I mean, mm. I couldn't ask for a better partner and, and team on my end. And I'm, I'm I don't know, Nick, do you have any, do you have a different opinion? <laughs> well, we're, we're rocking and rolling. I honestly, I couldn't be happier with anything. It, it, it matters. And I, I know that you guys talked about having an incredibly well-balanced just team that's carrying you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, me and Ringo, we're sort of market market facing a little bit, but really the, the heroes of our business are the, the ones in product development who are the ones innovating um, you know, doing things that I don't think has ever been done before in the world and like actually just making everything a reality. So we've got, in terms of our leadership team, I'll start with Iksan Agustian. So he's the leader of our software team. We've got uh, 15 software developers. Luckily enough, he's spent his whole life basically automating spreadsheets to become JavaScript and not needing to know what the hell's in a spreadsheet. And if you think about our business model is, you know, engineers right now are spending all their time building spreadsheets. And every time someone's building a spreadsheet, they're reinventing the wheel, building the same spreadsheets at WSP and Arup and Oracle, and they're doing the same thing. So, you know, one of our company values is solve a problem once, use it many times. And that's what software is essentially. So Iksan, um, his brilliance and his skills is, is unlocked the way we've set up the business to actually get, you know, build what, engineers would build as spreadsheets and actually turn it into software um and ari as well on his his side uh on the software side is leading the team there but on the other side we've got um you know the people building the initial forms of the spreadsheet so that's led by lalisi and uh yeah she's also got 15 structural engineers and how that all started was like i put a job up online i'm like hey i'm the only one doing doing these these engineering i'm I'm not my attention to details not great admittedly and uh, she put the, you know, 50 people around the world applied for the work and I chose Lalisi and then I didn't think much. I was just like, just sent her a beam penetration, like highly technical work. And uh, after a, a week, what she sent back, I'm like, what the hell is, what the hell is this? Like, it's better than what I could do. And she doesn't even know what a glue lamb is like two weeks ago, right? So I was like, you got any mates? She brought her best mate, Wender, out along. And then, you know, once we were able to raise the capital, like her dream was to open an office essentially and run her own team. So she's she's done that. So she's grown the team 
to 15 and the world-class engineers essentially like another one of our values is equal opportunity and because there are in some of these countries like people who are incredibly talented you know one out of a hundred talent but if they're not just given any opportunities to the region it's just sort of like it just dies in the world and the world is in a better place for it so you know having having an office there in Addis Ababa we've got like you know 600 people applied for six spots just to show what the opportunities are there in that city so we're getting one out of 100 talent we've got like lots of stories but you know one guy on the team Girum, like he he started in Ethiopia uh initially as a kid right without electricity and he was starting agriculture and stuff like that but when he applied to university they said his dream was to become an engineer but they said now nah, we're going to give you agriculture we're not going to choose engineering and then Girum, like the, the man he is, he rocked up to the dean of the university's front yard on a Saturday morning and knocked on the door and said, hey, I want to be an engineer. Can you give me this opportunity? You're not going to regret it. And then the dean of the university is like, what the hell? Who is this guy? Like, all right, let's just give it to him. Anyway, so Girum, he gets into the university. Five years later, the same dean of the university is shaking shaking his hand on stage because he, he won the ducks of the university, right? So that's Giram. He's, that's where he started without electricity, reading one hand his book. Hey, we're going to get back, back to the podcast, podcast in just a second. second. But, but first, first, I have a question, question for you. you. Are, you Are you somebody, somebody looking to build a mass timber, timber project? project? If the, the answer, answer is yes, then, then you, you need, need to put together, together an experienced team. team. Our, Our partners, partners at Cornerstone, Cornerstone Timber Frames are leaders in heavy timber, timer timer construction timer construction timer construction timer construction construction and have 30 plus years of experience, which means you can trust them to get the job done right. They collaborate with Nordic Structures to bring you the highest quality FSC certified mass timber available. They also have some of the most advanced fabrication technology in the industry, so your project goes up smoothly without costly on-site modification or delays. That means they have the experience Network, network and technology to make your next mass timber project a success. Learn more about Cornerstone Timber Frames by clicking the link in the show notes below. As Herding cattle with the uh, other. Herding cattle with yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah. during the uh, day. Didn't have electricity, so he's doing those two. So he could study during the day. He's just born for it. Uh, yeah, uh, and now he's, you know, one of many in the team. Yeah. And, you know, what he's solving right now is like engineers would understand it's, it's, it's you know, the Timoshenko beam theory method, which works out shear deformation. And literally in FP Innovations, it says Timoshenko beam theory is excellent, but too cumbersome to solve or something. So, you know, we got, we got like absolute world-class talent on the team and they're the mm-hmm. ones who, who basically unlock what we're doing and basically the ones who we think are going to be building infrastructure for mass timber buildings and really going to change the industry because, you know, concrete and steel is the competitor a lot of the time, or concrete especially is the competitor for, for mass timber. And the reason it gets specified a lot of the time is just because it's easy. Engineers can wake up and do it in their sleep. They can pump out a design for a client, even if the client wants a sustainable option. It's just too hard to design sustainably. So, you know, with infrastructure, and if you can make it as easy as concrete and steel, then we think that's going to be the thing that, that moves the dial for the industry and really unlocks these buildings. So, um, mm. you know, that's the team. We're super proud of who they are and uh, and what they're doing. There's, there's so, also um, there, there's also Marco too in Serbia. Uh, so so he's he's part market facing with us and then part product development. He's a product manager technically, and um, Marco's output is so incredible. It, it humbles me literally because he he works with me a lot on the customer facing site we do a lot of demos together we'll go meet with people and just kind of show them the software as it's evolving and after sort of like two or three weeks of working directly with marco i'm going to myself man his output is crazy i can't believe how much he's getting through i was talking to adam about it and then adam goes you know that he's has the same output with the technical teams and i'm like what and i couldn't believe it because he was like what he was doing with me was more than enough anyway and so we have this really hilarious mix of personalities and cultures you know you've got serbia you've got ethiopia you've indonesia you have australia that's kind of like the the core mix in there and you have this, these different cultural and religious and language based things but you know we're in this really magical moment right now as a business with the culture there's just no one's mean to each other everyone's really supportive inquisitive curious you know and it's a it's a i've been in successful and failed growing businesses most of my life but this is a real magic moment like the goldilocks moment for a business so so we're just trying to savor it and and use it to create these just like really impactful software yeah i i love that story and as fun as i as much fun as i'm having talking to you guys it sounds like i need to talk to marcus and garrett more 
Uh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. pretty crazy stories for those guys. Uh, yeah. on, on the team side of things, you talked about, these are your engineers. You know, I think you said you had 15 or, or so that are actually, you know, putting in the inputs in the software. Like I work in spreadsheet land 24 seven. Like I live in spreadsheets, but I'm not an engineer. So unpack for me, what you guys are doing, how are you taking engineers out of spreadsheet land and putting them into software land and how does that make their life easier? Yeah, great. So at, at the moment, if you're a structural engineer looking to design, you'd basically like get a design guide, might be, you know, FB Innovations as a, as a popular example in North America, you'd read the design methods and then you'd start building a spreadsheet and in that spreadsheet, you'd read the design routine. So it might be like, how do you calculate the effective stiffness of a CLT panel as an example? build the spreadsheet, that's one side. And then you also get the, the design data from the supplier as well. So you'd contact the supplier or you read their design guides, work out their effective, their stiffness properties, their bending strength, their shear strength, all these things. You put it into your spreadsheet and then you do a design, you know, and embedded in that is a lot of, lot of hours essentially. And like we did a white paper and it's about like 500 unpaid hours across floor design, <laughs> beam design, column design, fire, vibration, the whole lot. And that's like, if they're starting from scratch. So, you know, we'll, we'll do all of that and we'll build a spreadsheet and spend maybe 10 times as much effort and time at that stage because like that's our business essentially. And then we turn that into software and at the software stage, you can actually start inputting things that you can't do in spreadsheets. So you raise the level of what would be that calculation routine. So what was initially done right now with spreadsheets by engineers most of the time ends up being a much better software solution admittedly there are there are other software solutions sometimes out there so what is the existing model um of of software basically a lot of the time is building free software as a single supplier solution so an engineer can use the software but you're locked into one supplier um and for that one supplier to build that software it's really expensive so there's if every supplier was to build their own software themselves, again, there's reinvention of the wheel on the supplier side, there's reinvention of the wheel on the engineering side. So, you know, what we're doing is to have something that grows the pie and rather than suppliers compete compete with each other on building software, you can actually have a solution, um, you know, that is built together, the whole, the whole industry can jump on. And for a supplier, you know, for us, it'd be like 1% of the cost of partnering with us compared to what they'd go with if they had to go on themselves. So that's, that's our, our model essentially. And um, when it's in software, it's like highly leverageable because you can literally solve it once and there's infinite leverage. It costs us nothing to once it's built once to fulfill it and get it into the hands of engineers. And that, that's really the power of software. It's infinite leverage essentially. What do you reckon Ringo? You got more to add to all that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, um, uh, I think from my perspective, like we've heard the um, we've heard the values pop up a couple of times during this conversation. So you heard us, Nick, at the beginning. We said, uh, uh, "Build it once, use it many times." Is one of the one of the values that we have. Uh, we also have uh, equal opportunity that relates to the team and having them uh, involved. Uh, we we also have. Uh, grow the pie, grow the pie. So you've spoken to grow the pie and that's what Adam was just speaking to then. So fundamentally our, our vision is that, you know, by building the infrastructure that, you know, every supplier may have a line item in their strategy that says software, you know, and that software line item can be anything from a small project to a large project to a program of work. And, you know, if we can replace all of those line items by coming on board to our software, then we can become infrastructure for the industry. And that's the sort of grow the pie mentality. Everyone's welcome. And then the, the fourth the fourth value is, um, I think this is a fun one because I, I heard Adam say it w- while we were talking once. We we're trying to plan after we raise money. We're like, okay, like what is the responsible way to use and invest the money you know the first one is like don't waste it so you know don't have any line item in your in your don't have any line item in your zero that you know could be questionable is like did you really need to have that two hundred fifty thousand dollar mass timber influence the party in the payments you know <laughs> you should probably probably try to avoid that one <laughs> yeah 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 so that's that's like number one but then we're like cool how do we actually invest across the business like what's what's the right way to think about doing that and that's when uh, don't be frugal on bottlenecks 
came up as a as a key principle you know which the origins of it is around from the 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 book the goal theory of constraints and then a whole bunch of other sort of principles in general but for us it was just like it, it wasn't just a call when adam and i are sitting there thinking where should we we invest where should we invest it was more saying to the teams hey if you are a bottleneck if, if you feel like you're the reason why the whole system is going slow like it doesn't matter if we've said we can't invest more it doesn't matter if we've said no you know we've just raised money we have to be careful you need to tell us that you're a bottleneck or adam in particular because he helps facilitate the running of these teams it's like that that is the right moment to call for help uh and so we've found that that's been both important because people have unblocked themselves but also funny at times adam because it means that we've had to wait a little bit longer for things to come through because they've been built properly but for me as the sales growth guy sometimes i'm sitting there just like you know maybe we could have been frugal on that belt bottleneck or maybe we could have built it once and not used it many times because <laughs> we could get something out sooner and i think that's the core tension of sales and delivery really is it like i obviously want everything now and delivery obviously wants to build things properly and we both kind of want the same thing, but the, uh, you know, our adjacent tension and the nature of our role always sort of overlaps with the priorities of the other. And so that's been, that's where the values are so useful because it's not a matter of, you know, Adam, the product development teams are withholding from me. It's no, we're working aligned with our values, you know, mm-hmm. and that's the, that's kind of the core thing there. Yeah. You want to add on that, Jody? Well, it's just like it's, um, it's a powerful analogy is like the the theory of constraints. So say if you think about it, the whole mass timber delivery, it's the exact analogy of how a business operates or, or sort of learning. It's the <laughs> idea of the theory of constraints investing in bottlenecks. So it's like a if you've got a, manufac- a CLT factory or something and, you know, in the bottleneck is the CNC machine, there's no point investing in your feedstock or, or the press or the QA or a new gantry crane or something like that if your bottleneck's always a CNC machine. So it's like mm-hmm. you, you identify the thing that's blocking blocking development and throughput of the business. And um, for us, it's product development. And we're so we've got what we call the infrastructure factory as well. And mm-hmm. and as we've been developing our processes as, as a business, the, the nature of where the bottleneck changes and – we invest in that. And so it started off in the Ethiopia team and then the software team and then now the product development team because it's oh, and so the product management team with Marco because the worst thing you can do is build a product that no one wants. Like you can spend all this time <laughs> popping it through the factory and then it pops out and then we actually had that happen once. But like what the hell is – like who is this for? What is that for? You know what I mean? And the same when it comes to QA, if you pump out a CLT panel and – and uh, there's a defects on site or anything like that, you need always your mechanisms to turn into standard operating procedures to improve your QA to actually get it better. And um, I think it's the, the analogy of, of starting a factory, running a factory is the same as, as basically any business operation. That's my learning so far. And, and that's what that's what Jonesy like from, from an outside point of view. That's what Jonesy does so well as a as a as a technical leader and as a leader in general of the business. Is that it? You know, if there are blockages in the system, people were like, "Oh, there's a blockage in the system." It's about the system, not the people. And that's kind of what I was referring to before about you know how good our culture is right now. You know, people aren't running into blockages and going, "Well, you said and you said." It's nothing like that. It's literally people just solving through problems together and finding solutions and unblocking things and, and you know that's why we've able to been able to grow quite quickly that's why being able to get products to market reasonably quickly that's why we're expanding to different geographies pretty quickly because they're working as a team to unblock the system not holding on to their piece of the the machine and saying no no but i, I built this <laughs> i worked overtime to build this like how dare we throw this away that's just not the energy in the business and and you know i, I think i find that really impressive to watch from you know, the sort of the, the outside of product core product development. And now it sounds like the US market is right on the horizon. Are you able to kind of foreshadow what your plans are for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in terms of our product releases, we we released an initial product. It was a light geared to the ANZ market. We had Euro codes built in on that. It was a bit, there's a few issues in it. It was a bit of bugs. So rather than just continuously improve that, we're in the process now of rebuilding the whole software and, Essentially, in this iteration, we're going to have USA, Canada, Euro codes with national annexes, uh, the Australian code and New Zealand code all in all member design calculators. So 
for an engineer to be able to actually change between the code and have your different K factors. We can have the PRG320, everything like that, the nuances with that, vibration methods. You'll be able to choose between uh, the new Eurocode, modified Eurocode, FB innovations as well. You know, for char models, you can change between Eurocodes and USA. And because a lot of the time what you'll find is the local codes don't cover everything and you'd want to do a deem to satisfy. So there's different language for what deem to satisfy solution is, but essentially the cookbook approach of your building code there's always gaps and sometimes you do need to borrow from standards around the world and and not everything does it perfectly in that region. So when we launch in USA and Canada, uh, we're going to start with a beta program in, uh, I, I want to say the date, but it's like a few months later. <laughs> the Q3, second half of the year at some say, point. Yeah. Q3, yeah, Q3 this year in, in 2024. And the first step is going to be our member design calculators. So from what we understand, it'll be the, there's a big gap in the USA and Canadian market there for, for this software essentially. So what that means for engineers is they can jump on, uh, you'll have automated design for beams, columns, floors, fire, point loads, shear walls, diaphragms, everything like that in step one. And then uh, following that will be connections. So screw design, Dow design, beam column connections, everything like that. And, you know, with that, if you got – we think it's when we one of the first times like a true concrete engineer with very little context can actually jump in and actually have everything they need to do a, a mass timber design. Because um, another one of our core product mm. principles and, you know, when you're building software that's generalist versus specific to mass timber, you know, the specific mass timber problems and like that is it's anisotropic. So it's got properties in three different directions. We've got that in. But the, the biggest one out of everything is the education side of things like mm. concrete and steel. It's very well covered at the undergraduate level. But when it comes to mass timber, it varies around the world. Some parts of Europe are you know, quite developed here. Some parts are not. But broadly speaking, mass timber is just not there at the university level, especially at undergraduate. So everything in our software is not a black box. So it's an educational design tool. You click the drop down, you fully learn the context around this vibration method, this stiffness method, and everyone can learn as they go. So, you know, again, from what the concrete engineer needs to actually design, they need to know how to design it. They need the design automation, but they need it not to be a black box and just like run the numbers. They need to build trust in it. They need to learn timber. So um, mm-hmm. that's what's coming for the USA and Canadian market. And I guess at the time of speaking, we're, we're open for partnerships with suppliers as well as the first step. And then um, on the back of that as well, the beta engineers who are the first engineers going to be the crash test what we're building essentially. I will um, I will build build quickly on um, the, the not a black box thing. I had a really <laughs> hilarious moment <laughs> you know, laughing already because this, this just cracked me up for ages when we were at a, it was a timber offsite conference last year here in Australia, which is kind of like a small version of the, IMTC, you know, we, we went to the International Mass Timber Conference a couple of months ago as well, and I'll sort of speak to that in a second. But we're at this timber offsite conference last year, and I, I, I didn't really understand the term not not a black box. I can sort of understand it from the idea of like the, the I, I've more heard the term black box in like the plane's cockpit or something like that. They review after something's happened. I didn't really understand it in the context we we're talking about. But I was standing there at our booth. Uh, maybe September last year, pretty pretty green to it all. And as people come by, I say, hey, how you going? Like, nice to meet you. And this engineer came by. Uh, we had our poster on the side, and on the side it said, you know, education features, you know, third-party reviewed, you know, supplier information, and, like, not a black box. And when we were there, I was like, it's kind of weird just to write not a black box about our software, surely. Like, I, I don't really know what that means. And then I was standing there talking to this engineer, and he's like, yeah, well, you know, I've just been looking at all of the options out there and they're just all black boxes. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what? And so I just got to turn comically and point at a side that just literally says like, not a black box. He's like, oh, cool. And I'm like, yeah, man, I got you. <laughs> like, it just cracked me up. I, I don't know how much sales you guys have done, but it's, it's literally like your offering being not a lemon and someone coming along and saying, I'll buy anything but a lemon. You know, you're like, I, I, I've got you. So I couldn't really believe that. And, you know, the, the way that that then translated, so we, we came to Portland, I think you guys, Nick and Brady, you mentioned the International Mass Timber Conference at the beginning. We we went in uh, March. Uh, shout out to the whole team there. Uh, Arnie and Craig was super, super inviting and inclusive as well. You know, would come around and say hello and everything. And 
we were there and again i've kind of been saying it's funny because before we went was talking to adam i'm like man you know i'm an extrovert i can't wait to man the booth this is going to be awesome i'm going to be charged up by energy by the end of the week i didn't go to a single after day drinks because <laughs> 4 p.m every day i was just completely fried but that that was the general fit but basically this was the feedback we got as well is you know we had engineers after engineers after engineers come by our booth see and they, they would catch the formulas they'd go oh that's kind of interesting we want to learn more about that and and their whole thing was like um they're expected particularly engineers that don't know mass timber they're expected to advocate for this material how on earth are they meant to advocate for the material if they don't know what the software is doing <laughs> it just it seems so obvious in retrospect but that's what all of them came by they were just so excited to see all the formulas the breadth and depth across all of the calculators and kind of understand like oh you guys are taking this really really seriously uh and so the the feedback there has been really encouraging as well that it's the exposure of the formulas the embedding of the education that make people trust the platform and want to learn it and the thesis on that like adam said before he kind of brushed over it he went oh we did we did a white paper what he means is Adam interviewed like 30 to 40 people and wrote a 30 to 40 page white paper <laughs> on the specific topic of using software to advance mass timber. You know, it's, I think the, the actual thesis, what, what was it? Removing the bottlenecks. Adam, what was it? Unleashing the bottlenecks for the adoption of mass timber. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so, yeah, there was this thesis on this business principle. It wasn't just a casual white paper. He went out and he spoke to everyone about what the things were. And the key thing was, not a black box. Was there anything else in that, and Jonesy, that you, you haven't spoken to that, that were the key findings? Yeah, I think that one and, and supply, I mentioned before on supplier agnostic, like for, from an engineering point of view, you know, the client at the start is looking for competitive tension, basically. So they need to be able to swap between the suppliers and choose what's most appropriate, basically. And then that's best for the clients because if you lock in one supplier on the drawings too early, you, you lose that competitive tensions. Um, so that, that was the other major gap, which I mentioned earlier, like even though there's single supplier free solutions out there, it's great for that supplier um, individually. But, you know, as an industry, what's best is best for the for that competitive mm. tension at the start of projects. So there was, there was that. There was a bunch of other things. But I think and the should, um, ranging of material grades as well, timber being a, you know, the actual grades themselves need to be updated codes and standards being a young industry that's actually going to keep on changing essentially like that's probably going to be embedded in and everything time you change it means if everyone's using spreadsheets it makes them all obsolete and the maintenance costs as an industry you know can be pulled into one spot yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i'd sort of also say that the supply chain have been you know despite having some of them having their own software solutions they have still been really receptive you know this this idea of growing the pie you know everyone in the mass timber industry to be honest seems to be pretty down with and so it's been a really really pleasant kind of coming out saying hey we're trying to do something useful and you know even people who have that leverage already seeing what we're doing and saying cool i can see the industry needs us i can see what you're trying to do and we want to work with you and support you either now or later anyway so you know, shout out to the entire mass industry, mass timber industry in that sense too. Yeah, I, I can definitely echo that sentiment. I think when as complete newbies to, you know, barely even knowing what an architect or an engineer does when we first heard about mass timber, it's like the, the industry itself is just full of a bunch of people that want to move the whole pie, right, mm -hmm. up instead of trying to like compete for a little tiny slice, they're trying to grow the entire pie. Uh, and like you guys have kind of hinted or, or talked around this a lot, it's like, you're not competing against other mass timber professionals or, or suppliers or whatever. Like you're competing against the concrete and steel industry. Like that's where you're going to grow your market share. And I think what you guys are doing is you're democratizing the information that mm -hmm. makes it easy for that to happen. Right. And so kudos to you guys, because that's a, as you know, it's a very, very big lift. Right. And so if you, <laughs> you guys are, you guys are kind of like that fulcrum where you're kind of amplifying force to lift up all the manufacturers and all the engineers rather than trying to create these single point connections, right? Like you, instead of, instead of like cranking out a two by four, you guys are building a glue lamb beam, right? That you can lever the whole industry with. Uh, and so <laughs> I love that. And so on that note, like uh, you guys talked a little bit about your backgrounds, you know, coming from engineering and manufacturing and software, but like, where are you guys going to inform you and your team members on the industry? Like where do you guys go to get information? Oh, gotcha. There's well, there's heaps of heaps of different places. I mean, um, 
I mean, my, my information personally is not not spec- always specifically on mass timber. I, I think I get that just through previous experiences from previous roles. But like in terms of leadership and strategy and everything like that, I definitely books. Like I'm a big I'm a big <laughs> book reader before this. I used to do a podcast where we read a book a week, interviewed authors, all that sort of stuff. And I still read read heaps of books. And you know, there's there's probably like ten books I can point to that inspired you know, starting starting this business and probably if I had to choose one, it'd be like the Almanac of Naval and that was just like a book where it, I don't know if you've heard that one but it's, um, you know, talks about if you want to make a change or want to make a big move or anything like that but there's three things you need essentially and one is is leverage and leverage is software. It's solve the problem once, use it many times and not tie everything to an hourly um, actions basically on what you do. So, you know, tick software makes sense being a mass timber industry guy before and then the second one is accountability you need to get skin in the game actually put some risk behind what you're doing and because you know there's like there's a peter teal i think i heard recently said intellect's not in short supply it's courage so it's actually going out there and putting your body behind the ball and, and trying something and number three was specific knowledge right so it's sort of like going deep and detailed into something that that you can do and you actually know the one thing in one area or one niche, whatever it might be more than others. And if you combine those three things, then then that's probably a, a good move. So that's the Almanac, Almanac and Naval. And so I was like, that was sort of inspired me at the time to go, hey, what are those three things? And it just sort of led to the idea that the industry needs software essentially. So, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still reading a lot of books. A lot of them are pretty kooky and woo-woo that are, uh, <laughs> one of them is recently which I told Ringo about which I don't need to get into but um, but yeah books books are everywhere man it's like <laughs> the idea that someone dedicates their whole life and puts a lot of effort into editing it down and does stories and puts a narrative structure around it that's easiest to consume for a reader essentially and you can buy it for 30 bucks it's like it's a crazy deal so you know, the leverage. light bulbs off. In there. I think it's that's leverage, man. It's like the the best investment you can do. I think is that. So books, books is my jam. All right, what about you, Ringo? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, like you're almost under. Yeah, you know, I think you've read at least a book a week for what seven, eight years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's madness, man. That's like, I'm so, so, so yeah. impressive, and 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 you know that that level of discipline and focus translates into. Jonesy's work as well like the, the level of focus and attention on on tasks is impressive I, I I've, I've read a fair bit in my life as well and I, I unfortunately I find it quite challenging to read during a, a working period there's just something about the way that time molds when my attention is split across like social contracts and meetings and work that I need to do and just trying to keep my physical energy flowing that I tend to just not read for most of the year and then rip you know, five to 10 out over the course of the year, either like really long flights or I get a holiday and I just need to turn my phone off and I just read like two books in a week or something like that. And that that's kind of how I do it. The, the, the way that I consume knowledge generally is um, <laughs> I'll listen to podcasts to do with the books that Adam's reading <laughs> so, so that we can kind of get on the same page about things. And then, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I listen and read pretty broadly, to be honest, you know, because a lot of my, a lot of my work is about building on who I am as a person so I can relate with people better, so I can have more humility, so I can walk into a room. You know, I'm totally new to the mass timber industry, so I can kind of walk in and just be like calm and secure within myself and just gravitate in the right people. And so you know, I spend a lot of time, to, to be honest, at reading probably more books around or content around emotions. You know, that's, that's something that I've spent a lot of time is learning to get my emotions uh, into check. You know, Brene Brown is someone who's a massive emotions researcher in the, in the U.S., obviously. Um, Adam Grant, uh, those sorts of people. So that's about like potential and just trying to maximize, you know, you as a human being. And then for learning about, you know, mass timber, because I'm a fly on the wall in so many meetings now with, with Adam and with Marco. I get to see what we're presenting. Things aren't confusing to me anymore. And also, you know, when we were raising capital the first couple of times, you know, I, I had to try and act as a, I don't know, as a translator, a fair word, <laughs> Jonesy, yeah, between yeah. the teams and the investors. And we'd sort of say, like, look, convince me first, and then I'll figure out how to get the language that's right for investors. And then over time, it's sort of 
molds in because th there is a real value of having someone who's totally fresh and doesn't know anything about the space because I can sort of bridge bridge the gap well enough um, after a few months. There, there was a funny f uh, period. What was that thing I was saying, Adam? Um, there was a, the, the extended gamma method. I had it in my head it was the extended gamma ray method because <laughs> gamma ray sounds sick. And so, you know, I said it probably two or three times to investors and then one day Jonesy grabbed me and he's like, look, you know, the investors aren't going to know, but just so you know, it's not extended gamma ray and I don't know what you're saying <laughs> and you probably shouldn't say that in front of engineers or suppliers. I go, fuck yeah, man, that's he taught me. So, you know, that, that that's again, that's part of the humility is like enjoying stumbling and I think like a lot of the learning I do is about figuring out like how do you develop a mindset that embraces chaos and failure and sees it as tools to be better and I think that I would probably shout out one of my favorite things about um, working with Adam is that we both have a kind of stoic-like point of view towards drastic change. So if we arrive on a Monday and something arrives and says, look, you know, that thought thing you thought was, you know, maybe that investor you thought was in is now out or that release is maybe not going to happen in the same time. We both stop, take a big breath and go, well, you know what? Maybe this is what was meant to happen <laughs> through like gritted teeth and like a tense fist. And then within an hour, you're back to normal again. So, you know, kind of being in an environment where everyone can be like level headed through change. It, I spend most of my time consuming content to be better at doing that because it's a, it's an energy that is just so useful to a business and to people trying to learn and grow. Those are solid shout outs. I, I Brene Brown, I, I look up to her. Well, she is, she is, and wickedly smart and just a, a really cool person and stoicism. Have you, have you gotten on uh, you got to check out Seneca, the shortness of life. It's like 40 pages and it's, it's yeah. It, like sit down over a cup of tea. I, I love that book. It, do you talk about stoicism? And I'm sure you've checked out like Marcus Aurelius meditations. That's a, that's a game changer too. Well, guys, this was incredible. I hope it's not the last one. You have uh, you have industries to overtake, and and you have people to change in the sense of how to push this forward into the mass timber industry. We're excited to watch it happen. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. Uh, before we ask our last question, though, where can people find you and connect with you? Yeah, go to our website, CLTtoolbox.com, or reach out on LinkedIn. Just send us a message through there on LinkedIn, and that's probably the best way to get in touch. So Adam Jones, Ringo Thomas, I'd say that's, that's the way to go. Yeah. It's been awesome to chat to you guys. You guys are amazing. I've done a bunch of podcasts and I was just saying before we got on, like the, the standard you guys bring, I've never, it's probably the highest standard of just like just prep work and stuff like that. So well done yeah, on taking, guys. taking, um, this to that level in terms of professionalism. It's awesome. That means a lot. Yeah. Seriously. I appreciate that. Well, we're going to give you the fun question. If you have a magic wand, you can change anything in the world. It doesn't matter what it is about the mass timber industry. What would you change and why? You know, go first ring. I'll go a really boring mm. one. Uh, I think it'll give me time to come up with something more interesting. Okay. So well, my, my one's super boring. It's just like, um, you know, it's, you got, you got design for manufacturing assembly at the surface level, but like just like the data from what manufacturing throughput is being magically at the hands of designers at the concept. I think that just one thing will drive down the cost of the timber building. And like the more you drive down the cost in terms of triple bottom line, sustainability is tick. We know that biophilia, human health is a tick. But like if you can get costs, the third one done, then it's just like that'll change everything, I think. So anything that reduces costs, we're doing a part of it, obviously. But that specifically, I think, would drive the needle. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a boring answer, man. I think that's a, that's a, that's a good answer. Um, mag magically wave a wand. It's, it's, it, it's like the rebel in me wants to take that so literally and just say <laughs> something ridiculous. Like every building is used for mass timber. So I think I'll just double down on, on Adam's answer. It's just like continued driving of transparency th through every stage of the life cycle of these buildings to create optimization and good decision making that means that the mass timber industry never gets in the way of itself when trying to, you know, win projects. You know, I think that would ultimately, and everyone loving each other all the time. I'm always <laughs> about that, man. Saying the good vibes, so I'm into yeah. that. Yeah, but both wonderful answers. Love them a lot. Had a great time. 
uh, talking with you guys. And like Nick said, like this isn't going to be the last one. We'll circle up with you guys when the time is right. When you guys are pushing in, in full go in, in the U.S., I think would be an awesome time to touch base again. But until then, thanks for coming on. And, you know, we'll be watching. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much, fellas. It's amazing.